chapter number two, Luke chapter two, uh, JC and Sarah, thank you. Juan Carlos, am I allowed to call you JC or is that only Maggie is allowed to call you that? I'm, I'm sorry if I embarrass you in front of people. Luke chapter uh, number two, and we are going to, over the next three weeks, starting this morning and then the next two Sundays and then concluding at our candlelight service, uh, a series that I have entitled Gifted. Gifted. When you think of kind of when you think of the Christmas tree, certainly in our uh, in our American culture here, we we exchange gifts often. Some of you do it on Christmas Eve, some of you do it on Christmas Day. And uh, when you think of how we've been gifted in the person of Christ at his birth, uh, I am uh, I'm excited about looking at Luke 2, which is a very familiar passage, uh, but from this uh, perspective here of being gifted. And the first gift that we're going to look at this morning is the gift of joy. The gift of joy. Look at verse number 1 of Luke chapter number 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This passage is a familiar passage, in the, one of the most familiar in all of Scripture, even among the unchurched. Uh, we seldom hear these verses read or used outside of the Christmas season. But because this passage is so widely read during the Christmas season, people from all kind of walks of life, whether it is uh, those that are in church or out of church, they're used to the kind of the, 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 the rhythm, the cadence of the text and its basic message. But for us to get the full understanding and feeling for the significance of the events on the night of Christ's birth, we've got to take a little trip back into history. Mankind has always been looking for the coming of a redeemer ever since long after and not long after the Jew, uh, the, the, there was a Jewish nation they, they've been looking for him Genesis 3 verse 15 and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and so right after the fall in Genesis chapter number three between Adam and Eve God was already foretelling that there was going to be one that was going to be the redeemer he was promising to Adam and Eve that through her seed through the seed of the woman that the savior was going to come and was going to defeat Satan and was going to save men from their sin and so from that moment on the one and only distinction between men in God's eyes had been that they believe that promise and live accordingly or that they would not believe that promise and unfortunately live accordingly. So at first we only get hints of man's faith in this specific promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15. You see Abel's offering of a blood sacrifice over Cain's unacceptable sacrifice that was without blood. That's one of the examples. And there are early accounts in the book of Genesis, and we see other indications that the followers of God, they, they continued to believe in this promise that would come. 
and it had been carefully preserved and passed down from generation to generation. But when the time came for God to repeat his promise, it was to Abraham. And Abraham was told that through his descendants, all of the nations, all of the world would be blessed. Now Abraham at the time, he understood this promise to mean that he and Sarah were going to have a child at their old age. And many times maybe you have heard of kind of when when someone's preaching through Abraham and Sarah and their ages of 99 and how just so humanly, physically, that of course is impossible. But they understood that somehow, some way, God was going to provide through them a promised Redeemer. Now it might seem like a vague message to us, But given a little contemplation, we can understand as Abraham did that the only way that all of the nations of the world were going to be blessed is that their son, through their son, the one was going to come. The Redeemer, the Messiah, the one that everything was pointing to started off in Genesis 15, the first mention of the Gospel. And so that I could only be promised, he could be the only promised Messiah because the only three things that all men everywhere have in common are a common ancestor, Adam, a common infirmity, that is sin, and a common destiny, that is death, that's ultimately a lake of fire in hell. But only the Lord's promised anointed one could address all three of these issues in a significant way. And so Abraham, he, he received the sign of circumcision and thus became the first Jew. And through him came Isaac, and then came Jacob, who would later have his name changed to Israel. And to these people, the promises concerning the coming Redeemer were to be more pointed and more specific as the generations moved along. Through Israel's prophets, God would often reveal to them this anointed one, this redeemer, this Messiah. Isaiah tells us that he was going to be a virgin. He was going to be born of a virgin. Micah tells us that Bethlehem was going to be his birthplace. Isaiah also tells us that he's going to be rejected by his own people. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem Zechariah in chapter number 9 prophesied of that. His betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah also prophesied. His trial and his silent in, in, in his in the silence before his leaders was prophesied. His suffering, his crucifixion, his piercing of his hands and feet, the mocking, his prayer for his enemies from the cross, the soldiers casting lots for his robe, betting being buried with the rich, his resurrection, ascension, and so on. All of that was prophesied through the prophets of Israel. And God was always giving more and more color and more and more clarity from that Genesis 3.15 that says, okay, you've sinned, you've blown it, I'm going to fix it through the promised one. He's going to come and he's going to crush Satan's head and he's going to save man from their sins. And so down through history, from the Garden of Eden until ultimately God shuts the mouth of Malachi, in every generation you can see Christ being proclaimed. God was providing the only means of escape from devil, from from hell. And he utilized every method, every opportunity to say, those who seek me diligently, they're going to find me. And he has been speaking through these generations. And so God's chosen people, the Jews, and God-fearers from every nation had looked for the fulfillment of this early promise. For the most part, they misunderstood the actual mission of the Redeemer would be, but still they were looking for a Messiah. The Bible says that right when the fullness of time was come, that, that, that Jesus Christ, he would, be, he would be born of a woman. Galatians 4.4 4 says, And when the fullness of time was come, when everything was ready, when everything that had been planned, <clears throat> excuse me, was properly in place, 
God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. And so this morning, as we begin to unpackage this Luke chapter number two over these weeks, we're going to look at it from the perspective of what we're gifted, in a sense, from this birth of our Redeemer in Jesus Christ. And mainly this morning, we're going to look at verses 8 through 11. And as we study that, we're going to see who were the angels talking to? Who were the recipients? What was the message of the angels? And what does it mean for us today? So let's start with the recipients of the angels. Look at verse number 8. And there were, in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And so you continue to read down, and then the announcement comes. But who, who were these recipients? It's common speculation by Bible scholars, and one that probably has a lot of merit to it is that the shepherds of various different flocks had gathered together in this kind of one large group. And they were all watching their flocks together at nighttime just outside of Bethlehem, right? You, so you've got, you got Mary and Joseph. They've come to Bethlehem because of attacks. That's all in the previous verses. And so we're going to kind of just focus in on eight and down. And so there's this collective group of shepherds here. And it's, this would have been done primarily for kind of to protection against predators for the sheep, but also just for their own protection, that they're gathered there together at nighttime. Now, it's very interesting to me that in many places in Scripture that we find God coming to people doing their daily routines. It's when they're going about minding their own business and fulfilling their own normal responsibilities. When God visited Moses at the burning bush, he was simply tending his father-in-law's sheep, as usual. When he sent Samuel to anoint David as king, David was doing his everyday tasks of watching the sheep, tending to his father's sheep. When he visited Gideon, Gideon was threshing wheat behind the wine press. When Jesus called his twelve, you've got Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were all fishing. That's what they, that's what they did every day. When, when Jesus called Matthew to follow him, he was at his tax booth. There are many other examples. And if you wonder what you should be doing for God on a daily basis, can I encourage you with this suggestion? Just go about your daily business. Work to support your family. Work to make your home and your family a little bit better, maybe each day. Remember the the needs of the church. But in doing those things, as you're doing your everyday life, remember whom you belong to. Remember whom you are living your life for. Remember Christ living through you and that His Spirit is in you and He's working on your heart for your spiritual enlightenment, for your spiritual good. And allow the Lord to allow you to be a witness to those around you. But listen, what should I be doing in 2021? Where God has planted you, live for him. Be aware of him. Go about your everyday life where he's placed you. And listen, if we are right with it, if we're if we're in tune with him, I think you know what I mean by that. We're walking with the Lord. He's going to use you right where he has planted you. If you're if you're submitting to him, and the time comes when he wants you somewhere else, where he wants you to do something else, guess what? You're going to hear him speak to you through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God in, in, in your prayer time. You're going to know God is going to guide and he's going to direct you. Get up tomorrow morning and do what God has already called you to do, but to remember who you're doing it for. These shepherds, they're just out in the field. There's mass, Many believe there's just groups of them together. And that's when the proclamation that we're going to study here this morning is made. The angels were not sent to the kings and the princes of the region. They were not sent to the mayor of Bethlehem. They were not sent to the village businessmen 
Most likely the innkeeper was too busy to even hear that message if it did come to him. They were sent to the shepherds, to the keepers of the sheep, to the, to the watchers, I believe, because they were the most in nature like those who would receive him as the sacrificial lamb of God. What did John say? Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And so the angels, they come to common man. Just people doing their everyday walk of life. God rends the heavens and begins to speak to them through this angel. And what's their message? Look at verse number 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Notice the angels start by dispelling their fear. What a wonderful example of the Lord's compassion. See, God, he, he, he could have skipped that part. He could have skipped the formalities altogether and just had the angels begin to say, hey, 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 stop. Stop what you're doing. I want you to go to Bethlehem. You're going to learn about what you need to go tell everybody else about. That's what he could have done. You remember in the, kind of in the Wizard of Oz when they're before the great Oz, right? And he tells them, hey, I, I want you to go back and I want you to, I, I want you to bring the, uh, the broom back from the witch. And they're like, but, 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 but sir. And he says, no, go. God could have been like that. But no, it's compassionate. Our Lord and the King and the ruler of the universe, He's not like that. And His angels are reflections of His glory and speak only for their Creator's heart. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news of great joy. From the announcement God made to Adam and Eve, His good news has always been, always been that a Redeemer would come and that He would save men from their sins. This wasn't new news. This is what had been started to proclaim in Genesis 3.15, begin to get much more color in Abrahamic covenant and so on from prophet after prophet after prophet. And now the culmination of it comes. It's not, it's not new news but the reason why it's such good news, the reason why it's so awesome, and the reason why it brings such great joy is everything that's been prophesied is now beginning to come to fruition. Through centuries of waiting, through centuries of watching and, and suffering for following God, now that promise has become flesh. For unto you is born in this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The angel is saying today to them, right here in your little community is the fulfillment of the prophet Micah when he said, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old from everlasting. They had watched. They had waited. They had prayed. They had suffered and sacrificed. And now it had happened. The good news of great joy. It's now coming to fruition. So what kind of joy was this? Well, it, it was God's joy for sure. According to the determinate plan of the triune God from all of eternity past, the Word was now becoming flesh. And that Word was now going to go forth to carry out the Father's will perfectly and completely. Jesus Christ was going to be the final Adam. He was going to come and He was going to live the way Adam was supposed to live perfectly in submission of the Father and ultimately He was going to lay down that perfect life and that life and that righteousness gets imputed, gets placed upon, clothes the person that comes to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. God would dwell among men. 
God would be the light of the world. Jesus, he would carry the burden of all sin for all time on his shoulders. And when this time was finally come, Jesus was going to drink completely full the cup of the wrath of the Father. Opening the way for reconciliation to all man. And what do we learn in Hebrews For the joy, speaking of Jesus, for the joy that was set before him. What was he willing to do? He was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to to, to endure shame and reproach and the suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before him. And so this is clearly the joy of God. Clearly this is the joy of Jesus, but it also was the joy of the Israelites. All through as a nation, for sure, they they rejected him. But he was no less the fulfillment of their hopes. They might not have understood it. They might have rejected him. But he was the glory of their nation. He was the very purpose for their existence. He was the vindication for all of their suffering. Jesus Christ was the, um, was the, 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 the the, the very essence of who they were. They had kept the law and they had held dearly to the promises made to their father Abraham. And now they could ultimately say, Emmanuel, God with us. See, this news was joy for the Israelites. They might not have understood it, but it doesn't negate the fact that it was indeed joy for them. So, but it's not only meant to be joy for God. His eternal plan now coming to fruition. Jesus Christ for the joy that was set before him. The reconciliation of man. The possibility of reconciliation with man. The joy for all of his people, the Israelites. I stand before you to tell you this morning that it is also joy for you and for me. The text tells us the joy of all shall be to all people. And that brings me to what the message means today. Look at verse number 10 again. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Although the Jews in Jesus' day, and really even today, have held to the, the coming of the Messiah would be for the Jews only, there is much scripture, both Old Testament as well as New Testament, that contradicts that theory. Now, I'm not going to attempt this morning to lay out all of those before you, but let me just give you, let me just give you a few examples. As I mentioned earlier, God's promise to Abraham was that through his seed, through Isaac, all the nations would be blessed. Now, the terms people, nations throughout scripture, and the designation Greeks In the New Testament, they're synonymous with the term Gentiles. So when God told Abraham that the nations would be blessed, even Abraham understood that the Redeemer would come, not only to the circumcised, but to all everywhere who would believe on him. And so Jesus records Literally, uh, it's recorded Jesus' words in Matthew 8, verse 11, that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And in Luke 13, it says, and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And so even Jesus affirms that, listen, they're going to come from all over and we're going to sit down with these patriarchs of Israel, but it's for all peoples. It's made very clear in the epistles that the gospel was sent first to God's chosen people, the Jews, but because of their rejection of the Messiah, the good news went to the Gentiles. That was all of Paul's ministry, right? So he, the, 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 the Jews, they reject the Messiah, and so now the preaching went on to the Gentiles. We're living in the time of the Gentiles now. But when the time is fulfilled, the message will go back again to the Jews. And the Bible says that the whole nation of Israel at that time will be saved. Although it may be clear that the gospel was first and foremost 
for the Jews, the abundance of evidence throughout the Bible is that God's good news of salvation has always been available to the believing heart. So, on the night of the birth of Jesus, before the nation had an opportunity to ever reject him, they hadn't done that yet, they were going to, or even was going to be made aware that he had come in the flesh, the angel announces that there is good news. And this good news is of great joy, great joy for all the people. Later in the same chapter, we're going to look at this portion in, a com- in the coming weeks, when Simeon, he holds the infant Jesus in his hands, and what does he call him? He says, he is the light of the revelation to the Gentiles. And so Jesus is indeed good news, good tidings to all people. He is your joy. He is my joy. The good news of Christ coming in the flesh was a joy for God. It was a joy for Jesus. It was a joy for the waiting and the nation of Israel. But it is joy for us. By the way, we weren't looking. We didn't know. We weren't even searching. But by God's marvelous grace, that good news came to you as well. That's what this good news means today. And here's what it means for you today. The good news is that in the town of Bethlehem of Judea, the birthplace of King David, according to ancient prophecy on a certain day in history, according to God's eternal plan, a Savior was born who was Christ the Lord. He was the Savior, which means the one who would be the sacrificial lamb of God to suffering and dying and willing to pay for sin. He was Christ, which means the anointed one, the one that was sent from God. He was the promised one. He was what God, right after sin, as he's talking to the serpent, says there's going to be an anointed one. There's going to be one that comes. And then that gets more color in the Abrahamic covenant and then on through the prophets. He is the promised one, the long-awaited Messiah. He's the Savior. He's going to save you from your sins. He is the Christ, and He is the Lord, which means the King of kings. The government is going to rest upon His shoulders, and He's going to reign in justice and mercy forever and ever. So what does it mean for you today? What does it mean for me today? is that you, my friend, listen to me, may have a joy that is inexpressible, a joy that is full of glory. Why? Because God became flesh and dwelt among us. It means that God has identified himself with you. He's identified himself with me. When you were unable to identify with him. We were separated. Sin has separated us from God. And yet God came and identified with us. It means that you can have joy no matter the circumstances that surround you because the baby in the feeding trough was the God of the universe who came to set you free. You can have joy now. As you come to realize the real and lasting significance of that night in Bethlehem and its impact for all of eternity, your joy will become full and it will be a joy that no one can take away. Because see, no one can take Jesus from you. Ah, they can take your stuff. They can take even your health. Stuff can happen, but they can't take Jesus from you. They can't take the one that left the glories of heaven to walk where you walk now. And all of this brokenness, to be tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin, the author of Hebrews tells us. You can have joy, my friend. The one humble birth in Bethlehem was the first step in fulfilling God's plan for salvation. The Bible has much to say about joy. Over and over again in his epistles, Paul exhorts believers to rejoice which is to express joy, which means to be full of joy. But I only want to focus on that first night and tell you that this is the basis of our joy. 
that God became flesh and dwelt among us. That on that first Christmas night in that little town in Israel was born for you. The text says, for you, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Have you believed on Him from your heart? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted His provision for your sin? Have you placed your faith and trust in that that He will save you and take you to heaven when you die? Has the baby, if you'll allow me to say this, been born there? Ah, not just here, in your heart. Have you been born again in Christ? Is there room in your heart for Him? Have you appropriated to yourself the wonderful gift that is Jesus Christ? If your answer to those questions is yes, then He is your joy, believer. He is the provider and fulfiller of your joy. And it is a joy that nothing and no one can take away. The angel must have been so delighted that night to come for sure. And I mean, just the heavens rent, right? And they're scared of that. And he comes and fear not. But he must have been totally delighted with his assignment. Hey, I'm coming and I'm bringing you good news. And this news... It's a gift of joy. And it's going to be a joy to all people. And I stand before you this morning. Listen, I've got a wonderful opportunity. And I'm delighted to tell you there's joy in Jesus. Christmas is so much more than the presents you're going to get. Hey, I like presents. You like presents. Christmas is a whole lot more than fruitcake. Amen? Hey, I I add it every year. It's It's got to make its way in there. That stuff's nasty. But man, Jesus, Jesus is awesome. And he's your joy. Do you know him as your Savior? Because listen, if you don't, this world can't even touch what Jesus can bring to you. It doesn't even come close. All that is fleeting. But Jesus, he's always there. I declare to you this morning the good news which is to be the greatest source of joy for your hurting and searching heart. And it is this, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Have you experienced that joy? If you haven't, I would love to talk to you after service and introduce you to the greatest joy maker there is. And his name is Jesus. Joy. My prayer is that your searching heart for that. Maybe you have a hurting heart that you would find this Christmas that you'd celebrate Jesus like you never have before because it is a beautiful, beautiful gift. It's so much more than happiness, which is comes from the word happenstance from what your circumstances. Joy, deep-seated reality of Jesus in you. Your Savior which is Christ the Lord. Let's celebrate Him as we go into these Christmas weeks. Uh, Next week, we're going to come right back into this text and we're going to see that it is peace, the gift of peace. Boy, we need peace in our world today. And it's also found in that baby Jesus who no longer doesn't only stay a baby, right? So your joy... My prayer is that you can find in in Christ, in your relationship with Him. If you don't know Him as your Savior, do not leave today without experiencing the joy that I'm talking about and that you can sense. Many in here know exactly what I'm talking about, that Jesus really is that joy. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I pray that you would ask the Lord to deepen your joy this morning in Christ. Good news. There's great joy in Christ. In Him. Ah, And it's a gift to all people. 
If you've experienced that, you got enough to get super excited today in your heart. Lord, when we think of Luke chapter 2, if we've grown up in church for 